All right, I, I think we're live on Facebook. If you can hear us, please give us a thumbs up or a heart uh, on Facebook. Uh, if you're joining us here on Zoom, we're so excited to have you. Um, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I am gerontologist and caregiver advocate at Home Instead Senior Care. And I'm joined today by Molly Carpenter, my colleague, a fellow gerontologist. Welcome, Molly. Thank you, glad to be here. Well, hello, everybody. This is so fun. It's, it's such a timely topic. Yes. Today we're talking about uh, caregiving around the holidays. So I'm excited, Molly, in a few minutes to jump in and uh, talk with you about ways, hopefully, we can minimize the stress that can come along at the holiday time. I mean, for everyone, it can be stressful, let alone for someone who's caring for an individual living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And Molly and I are we're actually both in Omaha in the same building, but coming to you from our individual offices. Uh, so we would love to know where you're coming from. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook, you can type in the comment section below where you're based out of. If you're um, coming to us in Zoom, you can chat at us through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then later we'll be taking live questions. So as we're talking today, please think about uh, what you would like to ask, information you would like to know as it relates to your caregiving experience, uh, especially around the holidays. Um, we have Deborah joining us from Orange Park, Florida. Um, and we have Carrie joining from Lex, Lex, uh, Lexton, 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 there we go, Oklahoma. Um, and we're also, again, live on our Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page. We can include the link on Zoom uh, if, you would, if you would like. Oh, we have someone joining us all the way from Norway. So this just turned into an international chat. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We are so excited uh, just to have the opportunity to spend some time talking about ways we can minimize the stresses of caregiving during the holidays. Again, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm Home Instead Senior Care's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. And our guest expert today and a colleague of mine is Molly Carpenter. She is a fellow gerontologist. She's also the author of a great book called Confidence to Care. Uh, you can check out her book on the website confidencetocare.com. Uh, Molly, again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you today. I am so excited to be here to chat with you and with everybody out there. Hello, it's good to see you from snowy Omaha this morning or this afternoon. I've just turned this afternoon. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this too because the holidays can be stressful and it's just gonna be a great discussion to hopefully help family caregivers out there. Absolutely. And we're going to record this webinar. So if you are sitting here thinking, wow, my relative uh, that I'm going to see over the holidays would benefit from watching this chat, or I have a friend who's a fellow caregiver, um, you'll be able to share this recorded version of the chat with them. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook, you can also tag them in the comment section below. You just do the at symbol and then type their name and it'll send them a Facebook notification. So uh, there will be opportunities to share uh, this great information after today's event. And again, thank you so much for joining us for today's caregiver chats. So we know that the family traditions around the holiday time, uh, getting together with families and friends, cooking large meals, shopping, having guests in town, you know, that's all kind of part of the holiday season. And that can really add stress to a family caregiver's daily routine. Um, and especially for someone who's caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. There might be in a different place in the disease progression this year compared to last year at the holiday time. Um, and so there's just a lot of emotions and a lot of busyness this time of year. So Molly and I, we're gonna kind of uh, throw out some topics and have a little discussion between the two of us um, as to how to hopefully de-stress a little bit this holiday season or minimize the stress. Uh, and then we want to hear from you. We want to take your questions live. So we'll ask that you type in your questions. You can type them in at any time. We'll get to them probably in about 20 minutes or so. Uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A box if you're on Zoom um, or if you're on Facebook, just comment your questions below. So Molly, I thought we could talk about kind of just uh, to get us started some general tips around how to manage caregiving at the holiday time. We know it can be stressful and it can be hard for caregivers to ask for help. Um, so often people um, maybe feel like everyone is stressed at the holidays, so I can't reach out to help 
to ask for help. Um, so do you have any initial thoughts for those listening out there on maybe how they can uh, tackle this or, uh, you know, find support or ask for help? Yes, I, I think that's a great question. It's a great place to start today. I think, you know, with caregiving, caregivers have all the same stressors that all of us do around the holiday season. And a lot of the tasks that we have to do, um, they have to do as well. So when we think about, you know, telling somebody to reach out for help, it's more about um, being very specific, but also, you know, hey, while you're out mailing your Christmas cards, will you take mine too? Mm-hmm. Or while you're out going to the grocery store, will you pick me up X, Y, and Z, you know, ingredients for the cookies as well? You know, so it's, it's not about, yeah, you don't want to, I think you make a great point, Lakeland, that we, we feel like maybe we're stressing them out even more because they're already stressed too, because it's the holiday season. There's just a lot of more tasks to do. But if you, if you think about it from their perspective, you're really just going to ask them to add on a couple of things of the, that they're already doing you know, like the examples I gave. And I think, I, you've seen this, I think people, they know when they have a family caregiver in their, in their life that has some stress and they want to help. Mm-hmm. And I think what, what we have to remember is as long as we, you know, reach out to people and we give them a specific thing to do, they're going to be thrilled. Even if it is something as easy as we buy the stamps and I'll pay you and mail my cards for me. I mean, that seems like, oh, geez, that, that, that seems like a pretty task that we do all the time and it's pretty easy to do around the holidays, but when you have a family caregiver and you're, and you're caring for somebody with Alzheimer's, that can be a really hard task to get done. So just being very specific and um, giving people a job, even no matter how little you think it is, this person is gonna feel so happy to help you that you gave them such a, you know easy task that they can happily accomplish. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that that is great. And I, I liked what you said towards the beginning, Molly, about being specific with the ways yeah. you need some help. Because, um, you know, so often uh, somebody says, oh, let me know how I can help you. And maybe in that moment, you're like, oh, gosh, I, I can't even think of one thing. So right. what might be good for caregivers to do is make, keep like a list in your phone or on your fridge of, of five things that somebody could help you do at any given moment uh, if they ask, like, how can I help? And maybe it's... Um, you know, taking on an extra side dish this year that you don't really have time there to do in family gathering or, um, and, and maybe it's just asking the family, hey, can we be a little more flexible? Can we tone down the celebration this year? Even, you know, um, so it could be, you know, not even necessarily tasks. It could be more of um, setting clear expectations uh, around the holiday gathering. And I know that that is something also that can be a challenge for family caregivers is, is kind of setting those expectations. We all have kind of those family traditions. Uh, and it, it, that's what one of the greatest parts of the holidays in yeah. my family, you know, are those traditions. But, you know, as we have older family members, we're starting to have to adapt our traditions a little bit uh, just to make sure that they can still participate, um, that the uh, family caregivers aren't feeling too overwhelmed. Um, So that could be another way to, you know, make the holidays uh, more enjoyable. Molly, what are your thoughts on that? I I think that's an excellent point about expectation setting and, and sort of like, we all like to have a plan, right? We all want, it's going to, you know, I have this, this, and this, and this is how it's going to happen. And when it comes to being a family caregiver, when it comes to the holidays, being flexible, and kind of resetting expectations is a, such a great point that I'm glad you made because, again, you don't if, if you set expectations and they're not met or or you go into it thinking something's going to happen a certain way and it doesn't, you're just going to be disappointed and that's just going to cause more stress. So I think that's a great point. I think the other thing because I also I love your list and I who I keep my list in my phone too and you're right that would just be such an easy way when somebody calls is to cruise that list and say oh yeah. I could use help with this. That's a great tip too. I think the other thing that I think about a lot during this this time of year is how do we have fun and and have laughter and how do we how do we make each other just remember the joy of the season? So maybe it's um, sending your family caregiver in your life or your 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 sister who may be a family caregiver, whoever a funny joke or a funny picture or a link to a funny video. I mean, providing a little laughter and levity during this time of year is 
is is really important because as we've said it's it's stressful to be a family caregiver and it's this is a stressful time of year and really laughing is such an important part of the holiday season and being with people so providing some comic relief i mean those are little things that i think we overlook but can make a big yeah. difference when somebody stressed out i mean who doesn't have a good hearty laugh to release <laughs> some stress don't they say laughter is the best medicine they do for a reason right that's absolutely that's, yeah yeah. yeah, I think I think you you brought up several great points there, Molly, and 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 you know we we talk kind of back to that expectation setting and um, making sure that everyone's kind of on the same page. I you've probably been asked this from time to time, and I know I have is um, you know I I have these loved ones coming over. They haven't seen my mom or dad or Aunt Susie uh, in quite some time, um, mm -hmm. and what should I do? Should I tell them ahead of time? how she's doing um or do i just kind of see what happens um i mean i would suggest if if uh your per if your loved one with alzheimer's is is progressed to a point in the, in the disease process uh where it might be helpful for family members to kind of have some expectations ahead of time it might be good to communicate that out molly yes. what do you think i agree with you 100 percent. i think letting people know where the person's at you know this is a, a disease that changes constantly and it, it can change from month to month week to week day to day and so setting those expectations helping people understand where the person's at currently and even providing tips for you know um she started to ask some extra questions like the same question over and over again lately so when that happens, here's what I've done to sort of redirect that conversation. You know, giving practical tips like that, mm -hmm. other family members and guests will be thrilled with this kind of information because they don't want to walk in and be uncomfortable. They don't want to make the per person feel uncomfortable in any of those things. So anything ahead of time you can tell a family, which again, doesn't have to be this, could be a quick email with a couple of sentences. I mean, it doesn't have to be this big, long, yeah. You know, because you don't want to stress people out to have to do another thing, but at the same time, that's just going to make the day go so much smoother, right? Yeah. And so I think you're right. Even um, I think I think what I've seen some families do is they even send topic ideas. Like here's a great here's a conversation or a great topic that brings a lot of joy to this person, or ask them questions about um, their favorite holiday songs because they love to sing. You know, so. Even some tips like that would just make the day go wonderful for all of the guests involved, including the person with Alzheimer's disease. That's, those are some great tips, Molly. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, having those few tips ahead of time would be so helpful. Right. And, and, you know, at, at the holiday time, you know, certain family dynamics can come out and, and someone living with dementia might be reminiscing about a story and, you know, we might not get all the details right. So also, you know, you could include like step into their reality. If you're not telling the story word for word, like it happened, um, don't try to argue with them or correct them. Um, you know, hopefully that can help keep any sort of conflict or agitation to kind of a minimum because we know that, um, you know, those are some of the common um, signs yeah. and symptoms of, of Alzheimer's and yes. uh, other types of dementias. As you mentioned, that repetition um, and um, that kind of short-term memory loss. So they tend to remember those memories from the past, but not so much um, what they ate yesterday or even what they ate for breakfast or what they did five minutes ago. Um, and then also uh, sometimes their their facts aren't 100% straight uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to stories. And, and sometimes it's helpful it's helpful for family members to understand you just have to step in into their reality and um and it'll hopefully help make the gathering go more smoothly so uh, i think that those are are some great tips and it is so important though i think this cannot be said enough is to still involve the person living with dementia in the holiday celebrations uh to, to a point where they're comfortable if, if they are you know, uncomfortable in a large crowd, you might have to adapt uh, the family gathering, uh, but still include them in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Molly, any thoughts on, on how family members can bring their loved one into the celebration if they're living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia? Yes, I think you're on the right track about the environment and about, um, you know, 
making sure that if they are uncomfortable in a loud, large crowd or a loud noises or, you know, really sort of you know, being aware of that, but that's how you set the whole party and everything up for success, right? You've just got to understand. And um, a lot of times with somebody that has Alzheimer's disease or dementia, a smaller group is, is easier for them to navigate. And um, maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So even finding a place in the home, or if it's, if there's a big living room area, a certain spot in the living room where they, they're part of the group, but yet it's easy for people to go in and out to visit with the person, that might be a good success factor. I think the environment is huge. And I think you're right. It can't be said enough because um, people don't think of that always, but it's seriously, it's, it's so, so important. You know this. But um, for all of you out there listening, it, just think about um, the lighting. Think about, is there a TV on and there's conversation happening nearby or music and the TV or music and the coffee? You know, there's all those kind of things that, that you should be really mindful of. And the other thing is routines. Uh, we talk a lot about, yeah. like when you and I, about routines and how trying to keep this person kind of on their same schedule or their same routine is so important. And that's not always possible at the holidays. but so, but just being aware of that. So if it's six o'clock and the person's used to eating at five, understand that they're better get a snack or better get something going because they're going to start, you know, maybe getting confused about why they haven't eaten or maybe they're going to kind of show signs of, of discomfort or agitation because they might be hungry. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of being aware of those routines and again, and what's happening kind of in the environment. What else would you add to those two kind of concepts? Yeah, absolutely. I think that routine that you mentioned, Molly, is, is so important. And, and perhaps as part of the expectation setting, you you change up the time of the family gathering because yeah. you know your loved one is more alert in the morning as opposed to the afternoon. So maybe it's a, a, a brunch type of celebration or, um, you know, or you know, if you know at mid afternoon, they always take a nap. Um, perhaps you make sure that there's a place in, in the gathering uh, home or wherever for them to, to, to lay down and, and to rest for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that you, you said it so perfectly there, Molly, that routine um, can be helpful. And, and I do like the smaller group uh, suggestion as well uh, in the environment. Yeah. You know, if you're always playing Christmas music every year, it might not be uh, in your loved one's best interest to have the music on top of the conversation, on top of the clankings of the pots and pans, that might be a little too stimulating for them. So just, I think, take cues uh, from your loved one. Mm -hmm. also. Um, as the family caregiver, you know them best, and we want the family caregiver to be able to enjoy the holiday uh, gathering as well, but uh, kind of tune into your loved one and, and make adjustments when needed. I think that 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 can be so important and you know it, it's important for the caregiver to engage in the in the celebration and to take care of themselves too we know right. that oftentimes caregivers put themselves on the back burner uh, especially you know during this busy time of the holidays so molly do you have any tips or thoughts on how a family caregiver can take time for themselves over this holiday season yes uh, well that's again during these times, it's, it's, it's everybody, but especially a family caregiver, even just finding quiet moments of peace, even if it's for 20 minutes or a half hour, you know, just taking a moment to reflect or, or, you know, think of all the things you're grateful for, whatever it might be, but you can't, you've got to still pause and do that during this time of year. And I think the other thing, if you, if you aren't able to sort of relax or, you know, go do a, spa treatment or, you know, do your own thing all the time because this isn't, there's extra activities this time of year. Think about the things you can control, like your, the food you're eating, frankly, and the water and how much water and everything you're drinking. You know, I don't know about you guys, but after so many days, I, I was at Thanksgiving after, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I start to not feel good. And it's because I'm not eating my normal food. I'm eating more sweets than I normally do. And I'm listening to my body going, oh boy, I gotta get, I gotta get scout a salad, I gotta get back on my routine, right? So again, family caregivers, sometimes I'm a stress eater. We might want to eat, you know, all these extra foods and stuff because we're stressed, but what you're putting in your body during this time is so, so important, you know, because you're probably gonna be a little extra tired as usual. So, you know, thinking about keep keep your water bottle nearby, keep hydrating and watch the the intake of your of your food. 
it does so much to your mood and how you're processing and feeling about these holiday seasons. And then again, um, just being aware of, of your feelings, noticing how, how your body's feeling and your stress levels and all those things is so important. So if you, anything you can do to pause and sort of, you know, think about ways that you can take just little mini breaks. You know, we, have, we often talk about little mini breaks, but like, and what else would you add to what else the family can do in these times to kind of, you know, take care of themselves yet still enjoy these holiday seasons? Yeah, I think you made great points about hydration and making sure you're getting uh, proper nutrients. I definitely had a baking day the other day and had too many sweets and I felt awful the next day. Yes. So yeah. I've been chugging water like a crazy person. Uh, but also just, you know, exercise can be a, yes. a great addition this time of year. I know, you know, we have snow on the ground, so walking outside isn't necessarily ideal for us. But if you can go for a walk around the block or, um, you know, even in your basement, um, there's a lot of great, you know, YouTube videos with yoga or, you know, yeah. a seven minute cardio workout, you can just take a few minutes. Um, that's going to do a lot for you. It's going to boost your endorphins. It's going to, uh, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to lay down on the couch and take a 20 minute nap. But if I do, you know, 10 jumping jacks and 10 push ups, sometimes I'm even more energized than that right. nap would provide. And so you have to know your body, of course, and, and balance. But I think that those um, are all great tips, but also back to what we started the conversation out with, you know, not being afraid to ask for help um, when needed, uh, knowing when you've hit your limit and you need a break um, from the caregiving scenario, maybe you call upon a friend or loved one to come over and, and be with your, uh, um, with the individual living with dementia for a little while while you get out and take care of yourself mm -hmm. or, um, you know, hiring a home care company, like the, the services we provide at home instead, um, having a professional caregiver come in can provide great respite. Uh, a lot of uh, faith-based communities have volunteer programs uh, you can look into that as well. Uh, so there are options out there uh, to, to provide you with a little respite that can help get you away from, from the caregiving scenario if you need it at this time of year. Um, I think kind of switching gears a little bit. I, I've been keeping an eye on the questions that are coming in, which there are some great questions coming in. Uh, and a few of them kind of, um, you know, hit me as to great topics to cover. So uh, I thought that, um, let's see, I had, had one coming in about gift giving, which I think is a great question for this time of year. So Carrie asks, how do you help others and the family uh, with setting expectations for gifts? Uh, should she buy um, gifts? Should she have them just send cards? Should she have her loved ones uh, buy gifts? And I think that, you know, when you think about uh, gift giving, um, you want to personalize it to the individual. That's, that's the approach I, I like to take. Uh, and so, Molly, do you have any thoughts on, you know, for a person living with Alzheimer's, I mean, obviously gift giving might look different if they're in the very early stages versus right. the later stages, uh, but any kind of initial thoughts there for Carrie? That's a great question, Carrie. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so is the question around types of gifts, Lakeland, or is it around what, yeah, what types of gifts? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think you're right. I think um, understanding the stage the person's in is very, is very um, important. Um, so when you think about, you know, early stages, a lot of gifts that you would normally give are probably still very appropriate. And I think though, um, one, one gift that a lot of people kind of give is that notion around, um, keeping your brain active. So how do you give gifts that, or what are gift ideas around like crossword puzzle books or any kind of books? that, um, you know, challenge your brain, different games, different like Sudoku, Sudoku or whatever that, that game is that I don't know how to play very well, you know, um, those kind of things. Or even, uh, I think, um, this, think about does whatever gift you're giving, a, a lot of people go with, you know, the non-slip socks and blankets and robes, and those are all warm and cozy and such appropriate gifts for this time of year. But think about when it isn't as cold out and in the spring and maybe memberships like a museum membership or or something like that where you can create an experience for the person that could still get out you know and again i'm talking probably the early to middle stages you know the, the it's still appropriate to do those things um what else would you add i mean books movies you know 
those kind of things. What else, like, would you add to that? Yeah, I, I, I love that experiential gift yeah. idea. Um, you know, and if you're thinking about somebody kind of in the earlier stages, we know that art uh, can be so therapeutic. So maybe it's even, you know, a pottery class, uh, you get them that, or an art class of some sort, or art supplies. Um, and yeah, I loved that experiential gift. You, I mean, of course, um, kind of reminiscing or um, like creating a, a picture book of, of yes. past family photos yes. uh, or kind of creating a family tree for them to use as kind of a reminiscing tool it could be a really kind of neat and meaningful gift uh, that right. you can give someone really, I think at almost any stage of the disease. Um, and then also um, when you think about someone who may be in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease, maybe they're not as uh, verbal, they're not able to communicate. You can think about gifts that kind of touch their senses. Um, you know, a beautiful smelling candle that their caregiver could light and have in the room, or uh, I loved your soft robe, or, uh, you know, they even have uh, robotic animals, um, a cat or a dog that if your loved one uh, has always been a pet person but maybe can't have an animal in the home, that might be a great uh, item for them this holiday season, or um, some have success with a, a baby doll as they're in the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. And if they were a mother and that's something that's meaningful to them, that could be a neat way to engage them. But again, you need to know the person because those kinds of gifts won't be appropriate for everyone living with the disease. But I think that there are um, a lot of different types of gifts that you can give. And, and to Carrie's question about, you know, sending cards, I think that you know, that can be uh, neat too. I know when we were, when we were younger, you know, you get all those Christmas cards and they're so beautiful. Uh, my, my mom would always have us uh, kind of cut them out and make a scrapbook out of uh, the Christmas cards that we received every year, just as a way to kind of, then we would go back and reminisce about the pictures that we got. So you can even kind of turn different uh, kind of holiday um, tasks into activities uh, for someone living with Alzheimer's, another type of dementia that could be an, a neat way to incorporate them into the holiday season. So maybe they help with those holiday cards or um, um, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can engage your loved ones. So Carrie, we hope that those uh, ideas are, are helpful to you. Um, and then of course, uh, one final gift you can give any time of the year is companionship. I think that, you know, um, an individual living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, uh, no matter what stage they are in the disease process, um, spending time with them and just, um, you know, holding their hand or doing an activity together or, um, you know, simply sitting next to one another and um, just being and soaking in everything that the holiday has to offer us, the great holiday music, watch a movie together, one of the classics, um, can really just be the best gift you can give it, anyone, really, this time of year. So um, I think one topic I do want to touch on quickly before we go uh, open it up to all the questions, um, I think is, is after the holidays. I mean, we know that there's the hustle and bustle of the holidays, there's so much activity going on, uh, but then the holidays end. And everyone goes home and we all come off of our sugar highs. And, um, <laughs> and then sometimes the holiday blues can set in. Um, people aren't coming to visit. People aren't extending a hand to help. Um, and so it can, it can be a challenging time. So we need to not only focus on the holidays, but uh, you know, after the holidays as well. Molly, do you have any thoughts um, on that topic? I, yes, I think um, it's an important topic. I'm glad we're covering it here because I don't think people think that this really exists, the holiday blues kind of thing, and it does. And even we all experience it, right? I, I experience it every year too. So first off is recognizing that you're probably going to feel a little blue after this big season with all these extra fun, special things that's going to happen. So things like... Um, Again, maybe during this holiday season, you've reconnected with people. So how can you think of ways to stay connected? You know, maybe it's um, a different, uh, an app on your phone, or maybe it's through, you know, you're going to do more on Facebook. It, find ways that you can stay connected with your circle. And especially heading into, if you live in a cold place like Omaha, in these long winter months, you're going to need your support still. So 
thinking of ways to stay connected to people. Also, kind of getting back into your routine. It sounds kind of mundane and boring after all the fun we all just had at the holidays, but the quicker we can get kind of back into our normal routine and get back into our life, things start to feel like, oh, okay, everything's going to be okay. You're kind of like, you come at peace with, with the holiday seasons being over. And I think another thing that, again, if you, in the long winter months, I, I call them here in Omaha, but it, it, even if you live in a nice part of the area, there is kind of this few months where there's not a lot of fun things happening, right? It's just a, a quieter time of the year. So think of fun events you could maybe plan, like a Valentine's Day party or you know, a trip to the museum in January rather than waiting till the spring or, you know, just ways to, to sort of make some fun for the rest of the year. Even having a little event like a, a Valentine's Day party is something to look forward to. It's something to plan. It's something to think about. It's something to invite your circle to again. So get creative and sort of start thinking of ways that you can think, plan an event to look forward to. Mm -hmm. You know, Lakeland, what else would you add to sort of beating these holiday blues? Yeah, I think that you brought up a lot of great points, Molly, and and also, you know, caregivers that are feeling like they couldn't take any time for themselves at all over the holidays, oh. this is a great time to get back to some self-care and, and taking care of yourself. Um, I know also, you know, if you're visiting a loved one and you've kind of, um, maybe they're not in the moderate to late stage of Alzheimer's, maybe in the early stages of Alzheimer's and you, you've you seen them and you've uh, noticed some changes and you're thinking, wow, uh, my, my loved one needs a little more help and support. This is a great time to engage in some planning as well. Uh, starting to have conversations around, um, okay, mom or dad came to visit. It seems like things are, um, you know, going pretty good, but do you need some help and support? What are some ways that we can, um, you know, get you some extra help, whether it's the family chipping in, creating kind of a calendar, um, or I know at home and said, we get an influx of phone calls this time of year because people are reaching out. They want to learn more about professional caregiving, having people into the home to support. So, um, you know, take this time, this kind of lull in the season to, to plan. Even if your loved one is in a good place, uh, we know Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. So, uh, they're going to need additional support and, and resources um, in the future. So it's a great time to, to research your options and, and to kind of put a plan together before, you know, uh, an accident occurs and um, that sort of thing. Um, so those are just like a few, a few other things that, that I would add to that, Molly. Uh, but I think, again, it, it is important not to, you know, ignore the fact that the holidays will end. They'll come back next year, but uh, they, they will end. Uh, and it is, it's good to have things to look forward to um, and to find ways to beat those holiday blues. So thanks for those tips, Molly. I think if you're okay with it, we're going to open up for questions. Yeah. We have lots coming in. So right. I'm very excited to tackle some of these questions. Um, so we have Carol right in and she said, we were talking about make uh, laughter and fun uh, creating uh, moments of, of joy throughout the holiday season. She said, what are some suggestions to help the person we're giving care to smile and laugh? Mom doesn't really change her demeanor. She'd love to see her smile. Uh, they don't have small children with us to bring joy. Mm -hmm. So Carol, thank you for that question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've seen uh, scenarios where somebody maybe doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, changes in, in their emotions uh, because they're at progressed to a point in, in the disease uh, where maybe that's not as common. But uh, Molly, any thoughts, initial thoughts for Carol here? Yeah, I think Carol, that's a great question. And I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, I think a couple things is, I think you, as Lakeland was finishing reading the question, I immediately thought of young children. And so I'm sorry to hear that you really don't have a lot of, you know, maybe you don't have small kids in your family anymore. But I think about, um, is there anything in the community that you could go and get involved with? Or even, like, sometimes there's parades around Christmas. Or maybe there's a, a Christmas tree where Santa's, like the mall, always has a mall Santa and there's kids around there. Um, I know, you know, so, so can you go kind of have a cup of coffee and watch the kids get in, on and off Santa's lap and sort of enjoy some of those kind of moments? Or 
or even I, I think another thing that brings a lot of people joy and smiles this time of year is is animals and dogs and and cats. Like, can you can you go to a the humane society, your local humane society or shelter and look at the dogs or the puppies or you know I so I would think about things like that kind of outside of the box. Maybe it's a drive. You like you're going for a drive and you look and you kind of can experiment with these different ideas. Um, I think you know your mom the best and you know maybe what's brought her laughter in the past. So kind of trying to find ways to inspire that laughter again. Um, I think about like, music's a great um, way to kind of invoke an emotion. And if there's a silly song she used to sing or a song that reminds her of something, of an important event in your life, you know, trying to bring up some of those, that music again, that, that can usually change somebody's demeanor pretty quickly. Um, Lincoln, what else would you add there as I keep thinking about this one? It's a good question. Yeah, it is a really good question. And I, I like your suggestions, Molly. And, and if, Carol, if you can't get your mom out of the house, you know, I liked Molly's suggestions of, you know, going somewhere where there are children. Maybe you have a family friend or um, maybe there is, you know, a volunteer program in town that, that, you know, families can come and volunteer to spend a few hours with your mom, or maybe you have a friend that does have a dog that could come for a visit uh, mm -hmm. to the house. But um, I, I think that you, you answered that um, really well, Molly. Carol, you know your mom and you know what she likes. And um, so it might just take a little trial and error and, mm -hmm. um, you know, also your mom's going to feed off of your energy too, Carol. Yes. I think that that's important for family caregivers to realize is, you know, if, if you're happy and in a really good mood and you're singing and maybe doing a little silly dance uh, in the kitchen while you're making, you know, lunch or dinner, uh, hopefully your mom will, will feel that energy and, and that can inspire some, some joy and happiness in her. And, and the opposite can be true. So when we talk about all the stress, uh, if you're stressed and you're you know, running around and huffing and puffing and, you know, in a kind of a crappy state, your loved one's going to feel that. So, um, you know, just I think those are things to be mindful of. But Carol, you can hopefully kind of set the tone. And if you can find ways to be happy and joyful yourself, hopefully that will carry over to your mom. So we thank you so much, Carol, for that question. Um, that's definitely um, something that I think can help everyone listening. Um, so somebody asked, uh, sometimes asking a friend to ask the question, um, sorry, let me kind of rephrase this question. So uh, when you're kind of telling these stories, reminiscing, um, this person is asking, you know, sometimes it's hard not to clarify information because you don't want, you know, family history to be rewritten. And I think that that, um, you know, is a, a legitimate concern. Uh, when we think about, you know, reminiscing, that can be such a powerful way to connect with someone living with Alzheimer's and dementia. And, and it can be very tempting to, to recorrect uh, them or, um, you know, say, you know, that's not how it really happened. Uh, and there, I think, other ways to, you know, document that information. Maybe your family kind of writes down family history in a journal that that you can kind of keep as a record. And that way, when you're engaging with your loved one, you don't have to correct them. Um, or if you're afraid that, you know, you're sitting around the table and there's younger family members um, and there's some misinformation that, that happened during that storytelling, maybe you pull aside that, yeah. that younger individual after the conversation and say, you know, um, grandma or grandpa has dementia and doesn't remember the facts exactly how they happened, but out of respect for her, we don't correct her, but this is how it really happened. So that mm -hmm. might be an approach, at least from, from my perspective, Molly, anything else to add? I think that's a great approach. That's exactly what I would do as well. And I've seen been done before so in my family, especially, um, I, and it's just human nature. It's, we want to correct people and, and we just feel like, oh gosh, if I don't, correct this. It's, it's not right. Um, a lot of times what I've, what my grandmother was, um, had some dementia in the end of her life. And she would say, she would just have the fact wrong. Of, and they were little things like um, five years versus 10 years ago. And she would say, oh, it was five years ago when really it was 10 or 20 years ago. And I just, I kind of got used to like giving my family a look that just was a look to say, okay, no, it's okay. We all know it was five, it was only five years ago. And she's confused and let's let it go. It doesn't, 
matter. You know, it, so it's just sort of like also kind of having a signal amongst your family when these things happen, because it's all about dignity and it's all about, um, you know, the person is still searching to be relevant and be in the conversation and be a part of, of the holiday. So, and the story and the history. So um, just, you know, I, I, it's sort of like, is it mission critical? Um, let it go. And if, but if it is like Lakeland said, taking somebody aside at, at the end of the meal or, or when the person's out of earshot or, or maybe went to bed for the evening, you know, re correct the story, I think is an excellent approach, but it always kind of use your filter of, is this, does it matter if, if we're off a year or two on this little fact she just said or not, you know, kind of a thing. And then again, having a look is, is important or, you know, a signal. So you're not, you just don't want to, again, it, it's all about preserving dignity. And when you think about this and keeping the person relevant. So just some, just a few extra little tips, but I think you nailed it. That tip like a good job. Thanks, Molly. Um, and we thank you for that question. Um, yes. So we have, Jane has wrote in a couple comments that I think are some great suggestions uh, and then also has a question. So, um, she said, go for a drive and see Christmas lights. That could be a great activity to do with your loved ones this time of year. Um, and she also said, you know, having some sort of activity in front of the individual during a family gathering um, might be a good way to, you know, keep them engaged in the task while people can have a conversation around them and, and reassuring the individual that it's okay to work on this crossword puzzle while we're all talking. You're not being rude. And then kind of on the flip side, you know, letting the family know um, just because our loved one isn't engaging in this activity and not in conversation with us doesn't mean that that individual is being rude. It's just something that they need to do right now to, um, you know, keep themselves, um, you know, in a calm state or you, you know your loved one again best, so you know what's appropriate. But we appreciate those tips, Jane. Uh, and then she also said, you know, sometimes loved ones don't want to go because it's so busy around them. So I'm guessing that Jane's talking about maybe a family gathering. They don't want to go. They don't want to attend. And I think that, you know, we have to be respectful of the individual. They're, they're still a person. They still have wants and feelings and thoughts. And, uh, and perhaps this year, uh, for that individual, people can come to her uh, or him and visit them, maybe in smaller groups. Um, and this thing makes me actually think of a question, and Molly, I'll kind of pose it out there. We had it uh, on a, a chat we did last year with David Troxel on this very same topic, and we'll actually post the link to that chat um, in Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, somebody had asked, you know, my loved one is in a memory care facility, um, and do I bring him or her home for a holiday gathering mm -hmm. or do we go to the facility as a family and celebrate? Um, and I'll just kind of share for what I remember from, from David Molly. And then if you have any additional thoughts, um, I'd love to hear them. But he said, you know, it, it depends on the individual. You know, if, if your loved one is um, in a routine where they can come away from the, the care facility and come back and not have added agitation or disruption, uh, then that's definitely uh, a great idea. If they enjoy go getting away from the care facility, um, it might be a good situation. If, if you find that, you know, when you take your loved one for an outing and they come back and the staff is saying, wow, you know, when you bring your loved one back, there's added agitation, uh, they're asking a lot to go home, those types of things, you might want to evaluate uh, and see, is it time for us to bring the celebration to the care community? Oftentimes they host, you know, family events where you can come and you can engage in holiday festivities um, or throughout the day, maybe you just have a couple family members at the time go visit your loved one at those hours of the day when they're most alert and engaged. Uh, but again, you kind of, kind of have to feel it out. And I think that also realizing it's okay if your loved one lives in a, a memory care facility uh, and cannot come home for the holidays like they used to be able to, uh, just it's hard to accept that, but um, you can create a new tradition or celebrate, take those little family traditions that you have and adapt them to the environment that they're most comfortable in now. And I think that that uh, works in a home setting too. You know, if your loved one isn't comfortable leaving the home, um, bring, bring a little bit of the celebration to them. But Molly, did you have any additional thoughts? You know, I think you did a great job 
you know, recapping that information and I agree with it. I, and, but you also made me think of another thing and kind of back to what Jane's comment around it's, it's sometimes a busy year and they just don't want to go or don't want to participate. And I think you said it too, Lakeland. We just, we have to honor the person and where they're at. Yeah. And I think we always just have to take their needs in mind when, and if, if, you know, like you said, if they, if they're going to be agitated when they come back to the facility, that's probably not a great idea. So bringing the celebration to them. But I think the other question that I would like to sort of address or bring up is what if you know, like I'm going back to maybe not the care facility, but if um, you know there's a big family gathering and you know that the person is not going to do well in the environment, how do you handle that? I've had families ask us that because they feel bad leaving them at home or they feel bad not bringing them to the celebration. And again, this isn't, you are honoring the person by not bringing them. If you know they're going to be very confused and uncomfortable and get agitated and all those things, you've got to take that person's needs in consider, into consideration. And so that's where, again, like when your suggestion of kind of bringing them the holidays or modifying. So if there's a huge family party and you just think that's way too much, they're just not in a place they can handle that and it would cause a lot of issues. What are ways that throughout the week, like a couple people could come at a time or you bring up a couple of things at a time and sort of celebrate in a different way, you know, honoring the traditions, but just maybe modifying the environment or modifying some of the bigger details. But families grapple with asking me all the time, should I bring them? Should I not? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I love that people actually are thinking that way because in the past I've seen families say, mom's coming. I don't care. She's always coming. She's coming and she'll be fine. And she's not fine. She's agitated. She's nervous. She's gets teary eyed. I've, I've seen it. And so we, but it's hard for us not to have mom there. It's mm -hmm. so hard, you know? And so I get why people do it, but I just think if we could be mindful during these, this season, you know, taking the person's needs in consideration, like you've said, and like David Troxell has said, that's really important during this time of year and honoring where that person's at. Well, and I think sometimes too, the decision factor might also be the care. If, if mom doesn't go, then I'm the caregiver and I can't go. Yes. So in those types of scenarios, that's when it's important to reach out and ask for help. You know, maybe it's um, reaching out to a professional home care company like Homestead, but maybe it's also splitting the holiday festivities amongst family members. Again, maybe you go for an hour and then your sister goes for an hour. So then everyone gets to go and engage uh, because, you know, if you're the family caregiver and that's something you really want to go to, it's important that you try to find a way to do that. Because again, that goes back to your personal well-being, your mental well-being this time of year. So uh, I just wanted to throw that last comment right. in there. But I think all the all the points you brought up, Molly, were were great. Um, we had a couple questions come in um, about the Christmas tree and the decorations. So Carrie had asked, and somebody on Facebook also, uh, you know, they're putting the decorations up, but their loved ones are taking them down, um, and they're wondering, you know, what are they doing? Should we pack up the tree? Should we take all the decor down? And and my first thought, Molly, is maybe that they're sensing a change in the environment and yes. it's making them uncomfortable. So, you know, that tree didn't always used to be there. Why is there a tree in the living room? That might be a foreign concept to them now. Maybe they're not connecting the dots like they used to be able to because of the way dementia is impacting the brain. Um, you know, it is a disease of the brain. So it's causing the brain not to function properly. So that could be just, you know, their brain can't process it. So maybe it is best to reduce the agitation um, or to make them more comfortable to take those decorations down or decorate in a different way. Or yes. maybe it turns into an activity. Every day you put up the decor and every day you take it down and that occupies a good chunk of time. So there's a lot of different ways you can yeah. look at it. Um, but Molly, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think the, I think those are right. The good ideas to consider. I think, um, I think you're right. It's an environmental thing and it's, a, it might even be a clutter thing. Like there's like extra stuff around that they're not used to seeing. Um, I haven't had people take ornaments down before, but, um, and take the tree down, but I have seen that. And one, one thing the way I create a family did when you're a creative thing is they, they blew up about like, I think they were eight by 10 photos of, family pictures by the tree and by the decorations 
so that they can kind of see like, oh, this is this is normal. We've done this before. Here's here here's you, mom, in this picture by this object, so to speak. Now I think it worked a little for a little while, but again, that that eventually didn't work either. And it, she wasn't. I can't. She wasn't taking the ornaments off the tree. I can't remember what what she was doing. Maybe she was doing something with the stockings. I can't remember, but it was something similar. And the family tried that approach. So that might work too. But again, I think all the things you've laid out, like making it an activity every day, would be super fun, actually. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe um, taking the tree down if that, or maybe getting a smaller tree with just a few ornaments on it, um, with the most important ones, or you know something like that could be an option. But yeah, it, it's it's all in the caregiver's comfort level. You know, do they mind? I, I, maybe they don't like to reset the tree every single day. That that might get that might be hard. So maybe you don't put the tree up till a week or two before Christmas instead of you know in November or after Thanksgiving or whatever. So yeah, I think a lot of those those are great ideas, and it's just one of those. It's sort of a caregiver tolerance, like how like how do you want to how can you you know cope with that because it that's a lot of you know, redecorating every day would be hard. I, I understand. So, yeah. Thanks, Molly. I think we're going to, we have time for just one more question. And, and Jennifer uh, wrote in on Facebook on our comments section. Um, hello, Jennifer. She says, my mom wants to help out, but continues to just get in the way. Outside of setting the table, she's pretty much all she can do. She wants to be in the kitchen, wants to be with us, but it's so hard to cook and prep with her in the way any advice and um, I have a few little things that popped into my mind right away and then Molly I'll I'll turn it over to you but um, you know if, if setting the table is something she can do um, I think that that's a great way to involve her maybe um, she sits in the kitchen near all the cooking and rolls napkins and silverware Maybe she just, you just have a whole pile of that and that's something that she can do because she's helping to set the table. Or maybe um, there is something that she can help, um, you know, a bowl uh, and, a, and a spoon and she can stir the ingredients. Or uh, maybe there's small ways that you can help her to engage. Because it sounds like, oh, I'm, I'm making assumptions here, Jennifer, but your mom sounds like she used to be the one in the kitchen doing all the cooking. Uh, probably something she still wants to, she wants to be part of this celebration. So are there small ways, um, small tasks that are meaningful tasks that she can engage in? Um, and, and maybe she sets the table three or four times, um, you know, and that's her way of, of contributing. Um, and I think that that still is, is really important, it sounds like to her. So Jennifer, I, it could be that it seems like she's in the way, but maybe just slowing down a little bit and, and finding small ways that she can engage can, can be meaningful to her. Uh, so Molly, any other thoughts on that? I think those are all good ones. And I, I just, I keep thinking there's just little ways. I like resetting the table or, or um, kind of giving a new set of placemats and napkins, you know, like just kind of refreshing it. So she thinks it's a new table or a new decoration. She's got to reset it. Um, I think, may, can she sit in the kitchen and read the recipe still maybe to you or look at a cookbook that she used to look at? I, I agree with Lakeland. I think she just wants to be with you guys and be in the kitchen. Maybe that's, again, we're, we're guessing because we don't have all the information, but she just wants to be a part of it. And again, I, when, I, when I read your question, I don't know, there could be a safety issue there. Like maybe you don't want her, like you're opening the oven and you don't want her to get burned. Or, and those, absolutely, you've got to take some precautions there. But I feel like for the most part, you know, this is a big trial and error. You know, can you have her sort the spices or sort of a utensil drawer, anything to occupy her, but just so she's with you in the kitchen or can she be the taste tester, you know, or anything you can kind of, um, can you, can she do the dishes? Can she dry the dishes? You know, there's lots of, of little things. This is just going to have to be kind of an experimental thing and, and, you know, based on how your kitchen's set up, where she could kind of be out of the way, but still be a part of it, that would be, um, but, you know, yeah, this, it's hard, because I, I'm reading that she really wants to be a part of it, and I, I think I'm reading you're concerned about safety, and about, you know, um, getting the meal cooked, I mean, this is, this is a big holiday meal, right, so I get, I can see the, the stress there, but just try to find little ways to keep her involved. 
Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, we hope that that was helpful, Jennifer. We thank you all so much for your questions. There were so many good ones this year. Um, and, you know, this again can be a stressful time, but yet a fun time. And, and while it can be stressful, we hope that you can find joy and find opportunities to laugh and find ways to include your loved one living with Alzheimer's in the holiday celebrations. And uh, I just wanted to throw out a few more links that might be helpful. We'll put them in the chat box and on Facebook. Um, we have a website called caregiverstress.com. Lots of great tips and resources out there. Also, help for Alzheimer's families.com. Lots of great tips and information specific to Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. And then the Alzheimer's Association, they have a great uh, kind of holiday section on their website. So we'll uh, include those last three websites uh, for you as resources. But again, thank you so much. Uh, we are recording this. So we'll put this back out on our website, on social media. If you registered via Zoom, you'll get a link with the recording after this. Um, but we hope that you all have a wonderful holiday season. Molly, thank you so much for joining me. I always enjoy opportunities to talk with you and, and to help families, you know, troubleshoot some of these caregiving challenges. You're such a, a resource and wealth of information. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me join in this conversation. Anything like you said we, that we can help families, that's what we want to do. So I, I'm hoping today was helpful as well. Thank you for including me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, and we do this chat every month. So we hope that you'll join us again next month. Uh, we'll be getting the details out to you. We're just tying up some loose ends and it'll be towards the end of January. So we'll put all the information out on Facebook. If you're part of our email list, we'll make sure that you get the uh, registration information there as well. Uh, but we wish all of you a happy holidays and a, a happy new year. I cannot believe that we're already at the end of 2019. Molly, I can't believe it's going to be 2020. Uh, I in know. Two weeks. It's crazy, but, but what an exciting time. So enjoy uh, this holiday season. We, we hope that it's full of blessings and happiness, and uh, we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.